an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Florini, who will be presenting Beyond Hashtags, Digital Media Research and Marginalized Communities today. Dr. Florini is an Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies in the Department of English at ASU. Her research explores the intersections of Black American cultural practices and emerging technologies. Among the first scholars to publish on Black Twitter and Black podcasting, her work has appeared in New Media and Society, Critical Studies in Media Communication, and Television and New Media. Her monograph, Beyond Hashtags, Racial Politics and Black Digital Networks, was published by New York University Press in fall 2019. So please join me in silently or with clapping emoji um, welcoming Dr. Fellini. Um, I'll hand it over to you now, Sarah, and I'll mute myself and turn off my video. All right, great. Um, thank you, Liz, for that kind introduction, and thank all of you for uh, logging in today. Um, to come in here a little bit about my project. I'm going to try and um, just gloss the main issues of my book. I don't wanna talk really for more than 10 minutes and leave most of the time for discussion. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the kind of work that I do and the projects that I've been working on, um, the, uh, the project that I did work on with the book. Um, and then if any of that sounds of interest to you, then we can follow up with those. So let me, Share my screen. All right, so I wanna start just with here is my beautiful book cover, which I'm absolutely in love with uh, because if you look next to it there on, on the left side of the screen is the piece by Shanique Smith um, and called Out of Body, and she gave us permission to use her artwork on the cover, uh, and I'm, it might be, I shouldn't say this because I wrote the book, but it might be my favorite thing about the book. Um, and so to preface what I'm going to say, I'll just say that, um, you know, generally DH, this is a DH group, and generally DH comes in a couple of different flavors. Uh, one is using digital tools to do traditional humanities inquiry. Um, so using digital technologies to ask questions um, about art and literature and history uh, that uh, humanists have been asking for a long time. The second flavor, uh, which often uh, until recently and until uh, projects like the Digital Humanities Initiative here at ASU and a few others like MYTH and um, Often what I think of as the second flavor of digital humanities has been thought of as more critical digital studies, uh, but I really see it as part of digital humanities, and that is the bringing of humanistic methodologies and frameworks to bear on digital technologies. And that's where my work falls today. And so what I did in my book is, oh no, my... PowerPoint is not letting me forward. There we go. As I wrote about a network of Black American content creators and social media users between 2010 and mid-2016. And the network has three uh, sort of fun foundational anchors, but they are not l the limits of the network. The first, as you can see here, is This Week in Blackness, which is an independent media company that existed from 2010 to 2017. It's still around, but it's not as active as it used to be. Uh, the second component is a network of about 60 completely independent Black American podcasts. Uh, and the third component is this entity that has become known as Black Twitter. And those are the three anchoring elements of my analysis, but um, the network spans across a lot of different uh, platforms, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and uses a lot of modes of different media. Methodologically speaking, I use critical theory, critical race theory, um, African American studies, critical digital studies, and I do discourse analysis and ethnography. So the book is really based on ethnographic participation um, over the course of five years, both in person and online. And I just want to gloss some of the, the big takeaways. Again, the cover of my book, I just love it so much. Um, so the first thing that I really wanted to do with this project was emphasize cross-platform analysis. Often people who are studying digital technologies will bound their projects by platform, right? And that makes sense. We can't study everything 
uh, you have to put boundaries on your analysis. And so, you know, thinking about a particular platform, um, that is a very logical way to do that. The, the blind spot that that leaves for us is that's not how people actually use technologies. Nobody's just on Twitter. Nobody's just on Facebook. Uh, they're using all of these technologies in conjunction with one another. So rather than looking at digital publics as um, specific to platforms, right? Twitter is a digital public or a place for digital counter publics. I follow Dana Boyd and I think about the public as being both the technological space, which is, um, and then also the people who inhabit that space. And that space, when you start thinking about the way people move um, within that space, that face is very cross-platform. Uh, I focus a lot on this idea of imagined affordances. Uh, the term affordances is used a lot in digital studies and often people um, use it to just mean sort of the the features, the characteristics of the technology. And so I use Nagy and Neff's idea of imagined affordance um, because they really emphasize the fact that affordances are not contained just in the technology. The affordances, and if you're unfamiliar with this term, the term affordance is basically, um, it's, the, it's the possibility. It's the, the characteristics of a technology that enable certain possibilities. Right? So Instagram is a more visual platform. It has a set of affordances that encourages that use. Right? Um, and that's usually the way that affordances get talked about, as it has this feature and it encourages this use. But using this imagined affordances uh, framework, uh, Nagy and Neff helped me think through the ways that affordances are actually imagined. Um, just like many other aspects of how we interact with technology and that they emerge in the intention of the designers who have a certain set of um, assumptions, a certain set of goals when they design the technology, the actual materiality and design of the technology, right? The nuts and bolts, the, the hardware, but also the interface, all of those sorts of things, and also the users the users, their perspectives, their desires, and their goals. And these three things come together to produce the affordances. And so from this imagined affordance perspective, uh, what you end up with is if you switch out the third part of that triad of, of um, designer, materiality, and user, um, when you change the user, you get a different set of affordances. And so, I advocate for cultural specificity as a really productive way of analyzing technologies. That if we think about uh, particular groups, I'm, I'm interested in Black Americans, um, so that particular group, but uh, whatever group you're thinking about, right? There's, it's very possible that their perspectives, their approaches, their goals are gonna be different than the sort of normative imagined user of the designers. Uh, and it's so basically different folks use technology differently. Um, and if we take into account the perspectives and worldviews and values of the users, then you start to see technology differently. I advocate um, for black traditions of thought uh, and black communicative traditions as being particularly productive vantage points for thinking about digital environments because they're particularly well suited to digital environments. And I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A, uh, but essentially um, black traditions of thought and uh, communicative practices, oral traditions, also aesthetic traditions of sort of recumbent meaning making um, have all of these things that we think of as being digital have existed in black communities for centuries. And so I think that looking at digital technologies through that lens, um, thinking about again, this uh, imagined affordance triad of designer materiality user, when the user component there, if we think of it through that lens of black thought and communicative practices, we start to be able to see different possibilities for the technology. So one example of this, uh, just to give you a concrete example, and again, we can talk more during the Q&A. Uh, in the book, I read about podcasts. And one of the things that podcasts and sound technology, sort of mobile, on-demand listening with headphones, 
often gets analyzed as um, a technology of individuation. But you have the neoliberal individual subject that sort of cocoons themselves using sound to create this individualized sonic space. Uh, and I talk about the ways that these podcasts, um, these independent Black podcasts, draw very heavily on Black communicative traditions, Black practices of sociality that have long historic um, lineages, and that the podcasts that they create, rather than being a space of you know, individuation, that actually what I found is that the listeners are using it as sort of a, a sonic recreation of spaces of Black collectivity. And so a lot of the folks who listen to these podcasts work in offices or on campuses where they're one of few, if not the only Black person. Um, and a lot of them would talk about how, um, you know, they, they put these headphones on and they feel like they're with their friends, their family, at church, like these different sort of um, at the cookout, at the barbershop, these sort of different iconic spaces of Black sociality. And so I point to that as cultural specificity um, in allowing for new affordances to emerge, right? So I, went, I know I went through that kind of quickly, but the takeaway here is different kind of user, different set of communicative practices, technologies that uh, normatively were created for creating individuation are now used to cultivate collectivity. Um, I map this, all of this out in the first couple of chapters, the introduction in the first couple of chapters. Then after that, um, I use this model that I've mapped out and this approach that I've mapped out to think about cultural memory. So I have a chapter about um, cultural memory and how this network does memory work in this sort of trans platform multimedia mode. Um, and then I have uh, my final chapter, which is what I'm calling at, um, the use of this network at moments of, of turmoil and upheaval. And so I trace the use of this particular network um, from the way that it was used in reaction to Oscar Grant and his um, death at the hands of, of Oakland police. Um, all the way through to the end of, of the uprisings in Ferguson. And um, that is sort of the culmination of the book, but one of the points that I want to make is that often when people talk about Black digital technology users, uh, Black digital technology practices, they're thinking about these kinds of, of um, political uses, uses around these kinds of uprisings, uses around the movement for the Black, movement for Black lives. But one of the points that I try very hard to make in the book is that those, that is only possible because these networks exist and have been cultivated and are maintained through um, much more mundane, mundane everyday activities. And then the final part of the book that we might be interested in discussing that people find um, interesting is I have a methodological appendix. And uh, essentially, I, I'm white, surprise, uh, and I'm writing about uh, Black digital culture. And so that is a very fraught uh, process, my subject position, working with the folks that I'm writing about. And I often get asked about that. Uh, and it's not uncommon for ethnographers to write about, you know, self-reflexively in a way about their subject position in the intro to their book or even throughout. Uh, but I didn't want to center myself in that way. So I relegated all of that to the methodological conclusion. So I talk about that. I talk about um, sort of my, the guiding ethics that I came up with to try and um, try and negotiate uh, that very fraught situation to try and mitigate any kind of harm or uh, even just disrespect that I might do to the folks that I'm working about. I wrote a lot about how I decided um, what is fair game to quote or not quote from social media. Uh, so I'd be happy to have a methodological discussion with all of you. Um, and I'll just end there and um, Hopefully you flagged things that were of interest to you as I was talking. I'll end with, this is the full piece by Sinead Smith, which I just think is gorgeous and I wanted you all to see it. Um, it she's, she's wonderful. Um, but yes, that is basically, if you know, I had to give you a book report uh, about what I did with my summer vacation, 
right, writing this book, that would be the book report. And I'm happy to have conversations about any component that I touched on. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm using my reaction right now to give you more applause. And I will in share my screen. That's perfect. All right, perfect. So for anyone that has questions um, and anyone that joined while Sarah was presenting, if you wanna put your questions in the Zoom chat, I will read them aloud and attribute them to you. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand in Zoom so that I can unmute you, we can um, do questions that way as well. And I will just like take them as they come in. So while we're waiting for people to type and or raise their hand, um, I will go ahead and ask Sarah the question that I think I've asked in some way everyone that's presented at the Digital Humanities Virtual Hour, which is like, what is your origin story, right? Why was digital humanities and critical media studies and this kind of methodological approach something that you, you wanted to engage in? Um, yes, yeah, so I was bit by a radioactive digital humanist and no. Um, I actually, my master's degree is in musicology. So I was analyzing Beethoven string quartets and things like that. And I wanted to study popular music eventually. That's why I went to a media studies program um, that focused, it was an interdisciplinary program that focused on media studies, um, rhetoric and performance and ethnography. Those were the three fields. Um, and in the process of doing my coursework, I found out two things. One is that I'm an extremely ignorant white person. Um, and the more I found out in that way, the more I became interested in issues around critical race theory. Um, and then also I really, really found the digital fascinating. So by the end of my coursework, I was um, working at that intersection of, of race and, and digital technologies. Uh, this book is not my dissertation. I make poor life choices. So instead of turning my dissertation into a book, I started a completely new project. Um, and uh, the book emerged from my own personal digital media use. Like I didn't think, oh boy, I wanna go find some black people to study because that's creepy and gross. I was just, I was on Twitter in 2010 and I was interacting with people and that network was heavily black. Um, so the people that I was just interacting with and the people I was seeing retweeted, and then I found these podcasts through Twitter and I started listening to them and I became, a, you know, part of that community around these podcasts and that grew over years. And when Twitter podcasting, a lot of these technologies, the network that I'm writing about were really about two years ahead of the curve. And yet I would go to conferences and everybody acted like the only people doing anything interesting with technology were like white Silicon Valley guys. And so the, what became this book literally just started as a, what was supposed to be a book chapter in my revised dissertation that was born out of my frustration that like, stop erasing my friends. They're really brilliant and doing cool things. Um, and then it, it sort of expanded from there. So that's the origin story of my interest and also this particular project. I think that's better than Radioactive Spider, honestly. <laughs> uh, and then at, for Monica Boyd, uh, I'd love to hear more about how these platforms sustain cultural memory. Um, yes. So I'm, I'm obsessed with history and I'm always really interested. I always want at least 100 years of context on everything. Um, and when you, when I, again, everything about this book emerged from what was important in the networks that I was already participating in. So I didn't decide, oh, I'm going to, I'm really fascinated by history, so I want to write about cultural memory. But I saw so much of what was happening in these networks was memory work around, um, so we have a few different things that, that we can talk about. Um, one is that it's just a new space for counter histories, right? Marginalized groups, again, I'm talking about black Americans here, but this is true of most marginalized groups or, or all marginalized groups by virtue of their marginalization. Um, right? Marginalized groups have their history erased and distorted in ways that um, reify the dominant social hierarchy. And so they've always had to find um, places to create their counter histories and tell their own stories. And so um, these digital spaces became another place for that. Um, 
And the other thing that is interesting is also then the digital became a place of new modes for doing memory work, new modes of like, um, like mimetic memory work right, through memes. There've been these amazing um, trends and hashtags where people use sort of the format of, of the meme uh, and remix it uh, to tell these really, really complicated histories, but in this sort of snapshot using image, a little bit of text, and a wide variety of intertextual cultural references. Uh, so it's, it's an extension of what's happening, but also has added new layers of how people are able to create and circulate counter histories. Thank you. And I'm gonna unmike, un, unmute Mike. Hi. Uh, yeah, so um, my, I think my question dovetails a little bit with the last one, um, but I'm, I'm interested in sort of the specifics of how a digital space is created. Uh, I mean, there's obviously, you know, there's a specific context in which some, kind, some discourse takes place, um, mm -hmm. and there's, a, there's some remediation going on when you move it into the digital, but, but um, how do you, how, what signals are given that show that this is a safe space for expressing A, B, or C, that you, you know, that even though Twitter is essentially open to everyone, um, that you feel like this is my group and I'm here, how, how does that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, first of all, of course, when we're talking about digital space, I struggle to find other terms because it's really, it's a metaphorical space, right? It's not an actual physical space and even the quote unquote space of the technology. Like you said, Twitter is a platform. It's a network of, of people that are not just the people that I was writing about. It has certain aspects of materiality. Um, so in some way, myself and I think most digital scholars um, who talk about digital spaces are playing a little fast and loose. Um, that, that, you know, we're speaking metaphorically is that it's like a social space, a cultural space, right? Um, and the way that that happens, um, Twitter is a great example, is uh, there are, but everywhere, there are sort of formal and informal barriers to participating in the group. So the formal barriers are, are very clear, right? A lot of these podcasts um, in around 2015, when harassment got quite bad on, on um, Twitter, they created closed Facebook groups. You had to have a request to be in, and if you acted up, if you did anything unacceptable, then you got kicked out, right? Very clear about how that space was created and policed. Um, other spaces are like the podcasts are created just, um, I think, uh, through informal barriers, right? That um, none of the podcasts that I write about, they're all in the, completely independent. They don't really advertise. They don't really promote. They're, they're just, um, you have to know that they exist, which means you have to already have contact with the networks of people who are making and consuming them. Uh, and then you have to find them and then you have to download them. And then um, sound, the temporal element of sound is a really great barrier against intruders. Because a lot of these podcasts, because they're very conversational, very much mimicking um, they get referred to as barbershops and cookouts and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's not unusual for some of these podcasts to be two or three hours long. So, you know, if you want, if you want to troll somebody and harass somebody and be racist on Twitter, then you can put in a keyword search and you can find somebody talking about Black Lives Matter and you can call them a racial, racial slur and that's accomplished in 30 seconds. Um, if you were going to sit and listen to a three hour podcast, <laughs> to do to harass like that's an investment of time. Uh, the third thing is in terms of informal barriers are these long term communicative traditions that black folks and other marginalized folks have had to uh, develop to be able to communicate in plain sight right. Um, black Americans have a long history of signifying and wordplay and ways of communicating multiple levels at once. Um, African American vernacular English sometimes helps uh, obscure meaning. Um, also, there's a tremendous amount of cultural competency that you need, a tremendous amount of knowledge 
So I get thinking about black Twitter, about black culture, black media, and then things that have happened on black Twitter. And so there've been, uh, there've been a lot of um, research around hashtags. The reason I called my book Beyond Hashtags is because a lot of people who research uh, Twitter in particular scrape hashtags and analyze, um, analyze that. And my argument is on black Twitter, there's so much signifying and indirection and multiple layers of meaning um, that people are talking about things. And if you don't know, you don't know, right? It's not unusual for people to be like, well, you know how she is. And then everybody will be like, oh, well, yeah, okay, we're talking about that particular celebrity who was just in the news for doing this thing and has a history of doing this. Like, um, so it, it, there's a certain communicative tradition that is difficult to penetrate. So all of those things work together to sort of mark the space. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was, that was helpful for me. Um, and then we have a question from um, Jeffrey Way. I'd be interested in hearing more about your methodology as a white scholar studying black digital communities. What were some of the challenges you encountered with this project and how did you address them? What strategies would you recommend for others taking on similar work? Um, that, is, that is the question, right? Um, I'm gonna give what is a series of unsatisfactory answers. Uh, the first one is, um, so we exist in these systems of power and privilege, right? And we exist in a system of white supremacy, right? Meaning that not like clan white supremacy, although that is there, but in terms of our hierarchies, privileges, whiteness, other, um, other racial groups. And there is no outside of that. And by virtue of being a system of oppression, it, I always say that it gives you bad choices and slightly less bad choices, right? And I'm seeing this a lot now with white folks who are having moments of racial awakening, that they want to do the right thing. And the thing I always say is, do you really think, individual white person, that you are going to be the person who can make the perfect choice that only resists and in, is no way complicit with white supremacy. Because if you do, then that's very naive, right? Uh, and that's how I see myself, right? By virtue of my whiteness, like, literally anything that I do is, happens within this larger system and is going to have some level of complicity. So it is incumbent upon me um, to always weigh that and try and figure out the way that I can resist the most and be the least complicit, right? What is the least bad choice I have? And when I started this book in, in 2012, uh, there were six or eight people who were working on black digital culture. Um, literally, we all knew each other. We all kept getting put on panels together, no matter what our projects were about. And even if it should have been on a different panel, we were all on a panel together because we were all writing about black people. Um, and so it, I sort of had this moment of like, well, if I write this book, then I'm just another white scholar writing about black folks and black culture, and they should be speaking for themselves. But I also looked around and said, though they're not spaces for people to speak for themselves. And if I don't write this book, it may not get written. Also, if I don't write this book, then I'm just reifying this whole idea that only black people or only people of color um, care about black culture or race, right? So there, there's no good, perfect answer there. Um, and so based on the fact that there wasn't much of this work being done um, and that I was already part of this network, Right. Um, I decided that the best of the bad choices was for me to go ahead and be the white scholar that wrote about black people. Problematic? Yes. Um, in my estimation at the time, eight years ago, less problematic than everybody pretending like black people weren't on the internet. And, and literally in 2012, I would go to conferences and be like, black people are on the internet. And everybody would be like, ooh, except for like the one black scholar in the room, right? <laughs> um, so 
all of that to say is that there, you're always going to fall short. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and that you need to sit down and think about in advance what are the possible ways that you can be complicit, the possible ways that you can do harm. You need to look for all of the critiques that are being made of um, white scholars or any scholar, like if you're not part of the marginalized group that you're writing about, right? Look for the critiques and that people make of people doing that work and figure out how you're going to manage that um, to be do as little harm as possible. Um, the other not satisfying thing that I'm going to say is that you're also just going to have to have a little bit of a thick skin, right? Because when I show up someplace and I'm white, like the people who know me and know my work are like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's Sarah. Uh, but a lot of people don't. So I'm just this unknown white person. And since unknown white people have not done a very good job in the past, um, I'm not always going to receive a warm welcome. Uh, that was not the case with the people that I was writing about because they already knew me and I was already active in those networks. Um, but you just like, I, I've had people on Twitter who, who will retweet my article about black Twitter and be like, see, this is why we need more about black academics. We got this white woman writing about black Twitter. And yeah, <laughs> that, that is true, right? Um, and you can't be defensive about those things. You've got to take those critiques and sit with them um, and realize that there's never, there's never an end to that because there is no perfect thing you can do. Uh, the other thing that I would say is for people who are just starting this work, um, really, really decide if you are the one who needs to be doing this work. If I were starting this book now, now there are so many brilliant, um, scholars of color, particularly black women coming out of graduate programs. And there are brilliant uh, senior scholars who um, have been studying black culture and black um, social practices uh, in other ways that are now looking at digital environments. Um, I might not make that choice. And actually, I'm, I'm getting ready to start my next book and I'm probably going to be writing about whiteness and white people. Um, because then the question is, if there are already a lot of, of scholars from that group who are doing that work, then why, what is the benefit of you doing it as well, right? We're in sort of harm, again, we're in harm mitigation. We've always got to think about how can we resist and be, um, minimize the amount of complicity in the system. So, like I said, a series of not very satisfying answers. But still answers, thank you. I don't know about anyone else, but I just wrote down a lot of strategies. So thank you to Jeff for that question and thank you to Sarah for, for the answer. I mean, I wrote down things like sit down in advance and, um, and think about how you're gonna mitigate harm, but also like do your research, right? Um, and if you're engaging in a community, and I think this is any community with your research, then make sure that the trust is there. Um, I think trust is really important. I don't know if you want to talk about any of those things more, especially trust, um, or I, I don't see we have any raised hands, so I'm going to go ahead and um, pick up on something that you hinted at, Sarah, which is okay. where the work is leading you next. Uh, what the next project is. Because right now, I mean, a, a lot of your book was about, right, the reaction to violence against Black people. And we are now seeing that that continued pandemic, right, um, is happening. Um, and so I wonder if this new, not new movement, but the kind of reinvigorated or re reformulated or um, or resurgence of right the movement is something that is um, also inspiring your next your next work. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. I ended my book in mid twenty sixteen, uh, right at the, at the sort of the democratic primaries are over and we're going into the the general sort of where I. I ended, uh, and I talk about this in the conclusion, is that I, I, this is sort of this moment of reconfiguration of the racial formations in our society, that a lot of what I worked um, 
when I was writing the book, colorblindness was really the dominant discourse, right? We're not supposed to see color. And if we do, we might just be racist. So let's all just pretend that we're all the same because if we obscure difference, isn't that basically equality? Uh, the answer is no, right? That didn't work, um, but that was sort of the, the racial landscape um, that I was doing my research under um, on. And uh, now we're in something new uh, and I'm not quite sure how we're going to, how things are gonna end up in terms of racial ideologies. Uh, colorblindness seems to not be dominant or be waning or be, being revamped in some way. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the answer to the direction that I'm going is you know, in, in this book, I make the argument that um, black um, traditions of thought and black frameworks, black aesthetics, black communicative traditions are particularly productive lenses for thinking about the digital and um, helping us think about the digital outside of the normative way of doing that, which is the, the approach of the designers who are usually cis hat white guys, right? Um, and so what I wanna do in the next project that I'm developing right now is to keep that framework. So I want to keep all of my analytical frameworks and lenses um, coming from black studies and African-American studies and black thought. Um, but I want my object of analysis to be whiteness. So I'm really, really interested in um, the places where white people come to bump up against these sort of these black spaces online, these black digital spaces that have a different set of norms and practices um, and that the privileged black perspectives. Uh, it's a really interesting when white people often seek that out for harassing, for targeting, but sometimes well-meaning white people seek that out but don't then are kind of surprised at what they find when they're decentered. Um, so I'm working through that right now, but essentially that's what I'm I'm thinking about, right? Um, I'm trying to use black traditions of thought to think about whiteness and sort of provincialize it and as and not make it visible uh, and make the way that it moves in these digital spaces more visible. And if anyone else has another question, but I, I think I want to tease you out a little bit more, Sarah, which is I, I heard in there that like it's kind of like decentering whiteness to reveal something about whiteness, mm -hmm. right? And I wonder if you have any ideas based on you using this kind of framework in other projects about how, how that is going to take shape? I don't no, because I'm still doing the research, so I don't like to say like, oh, I think it's gonna be this way or that way. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's- It was a hard question. Yeah, well, and everything is in so much flux right now in a way that I, it can be, I think, has a lot of potential, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to me. There's sort of, there's a, a <laughs> um, People of color are experts on whiteness because they've had to be to survive. So there's a great literature, there's a deep literature from um, scholars of color about whiteness. So we have very sort of well established the way that um, offline longstanding whiteness operates. Um, there's a little bit about whiteness online, but with this sort of moment of, we've had this extreme racial backlash and now we're having this moment of racial awakening where more and more white people are are starting to try and and change the way that they think about race um i think it's going to be a really interesting time to see how that takes shape so i'm just my research tends to be kind of emergent um it's very not social science it's very not like i have a hypothesis and let me see or i have a I, my research question is like, "Ooh, all of this stuff is happening and it's in flux. So let's let's see what happens." I like I like that as emergent. I think maybe that's what I was getting at with my question. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and I so I, have, my, I I joke with students in methods classes that um, before I come up with like a, a real research question that's an actual 
um, thought through crafted research question, my initial research question is always like, huh, what's up with that? Like that, that seems interesting. Like what, what's going on over there? It's literally where I start. Thank you. And then there's a, a question from Nalabega Ross. Uh, what scholars of color are you reading that are talking about whiteness? Are there any particular ones you'd recommend for graduate students starting out on such analyses? Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, it depends on if you, like, there's a historic literature. Um, Rodiger, I'll put the, that's the name. He uh, edited a collection called Black on White. And it's, this is a great place to start because it goes back to, um, I think, Frederick Douglass. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long, long tradition and it excerpts a wide variety of black thinkers talking about whiteness. So that's a great place to start. Um, I would also recommend George Yancey's work um, as he very much talks about sort of making whiteness visible. He talks about, um, I find him useful in thinking about that space question that I, I like that we talk about space as metaphorically in the digital because he talks about bodies and bodies in space and the way that white bodies um, experience fear and proximity to black bodies and so it's, it's always useful to me to think about then so like what happens when the bodies are not in the same physical space right what happens to like the perception what does whiteness do? Um, and then Joe Fagan's White Racial Frames, I think is a good one. Um, Cheryl Harris has a piece called, uh, ooh, I can't remember, Whiteness is Property. And uh, it's really dense and I can, because it's a, le it's, she's a lawyer, she's doing legal scholarship, but she traces the history in, in the U.S. of how um, U.S. laws have treated whiteness, not as a social status, but like whiteness is property. Um, it's, it's long, you know, and for most of us, we don't need the, um, the minutia of the, the legal details, but it is really instructive to sort of think about that history writ large. Um, and then Lipsitz's possessive investment in whiteness. Those, that, those would be my. Thank you, Sarah. We might have time for two more questions. So I'm gonna unmute Mike for the next one. And then if anyone else has one for chat or, um, or otherwise uh, raise your hand or type that in for me. Right, so, so mine's just sort of a following up on sort of whiteness, finding whiteness on the internet. And the, the, the part of it that I've seen the most is where in a, in a weird sense, a lot of, a, a number of white people have self-provincialized without even knowing it, by, by realizing that they, they, ha they now have to perform whiteness. Um, and frequently, which, which I think a lot of people have not thought about, um, you know, and, and some of, a lot of that performance has involved reaching out for these classical models, almost all of which are done wrongly, you know, and are at least extremely problematic. And, and, and so on the, on the classical scholarship side of things, we often, in response, we got off left footed immediately, um, as you might expect, um, by, uh, by just trying to correct these guys when they were wrong. Um, but the problem is that when it comes to classical scholarship, um, you know, the monster is, is calling from inside the house. Um, you know, we're, at le you know, we scholars are at least as bad um, oh. anyway. Uh, and so there's been a whole bunch of, of reckoning that's still going on on this, but, but there are a lot of interesting projects dealing with specifically the performance of classicizing whiteness online. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, how people, you know, essentially documenting how people are laying hold of these classical models and what is it that they think they're doing. Like the the Greek sculpture, the tradition, or is that the kind? What you mean by classical? No, that's that's one. I mean, I think that's the one that's most visible to people outside the discipline. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, you're frozen a little bit. Um, but there's now a project called the the Pharos project, which is 
um, sorry. Uh, yeah, anyway, there's, there's a project now called the Pharos Project that's really documenting all this, all this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar. Uh, it's he, um, because often when people talk about sort of the origins of whiteness, it's like the enlightenment and the invention, this idea of the view from nowhere and objectivity and, and those kinds of things. And he points to the ways that actually whiteness and our racial logics um, have roots in medieval Europe and their relationship to the Mediterranean. Um, and it was just a really instructive, for me, it was really instructive to think those longer histories because I, I had always read the critical race theory that was like, and then the enlightenment happened and white people decided to be white and decided that everyone wasn't, right? Um, and so there is sort of this interesting, um, that's the only scholarship that I'm, I'm aware of. Can you recommend something? Um, yeah, I can get, I can, I can uh, get you a list of some things, yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I'd really, really yeah. like that. Sure. Thank you guys. And then we have uh, what our final question today is from Chris Lopez. Uh, librarians are becoming more and more proactive in fostering and teaching digital literacies. What practices or literacies do you think are most important in navigating the aforementioned barriers or using social media to identify, listen, identify, listen to, or engage voices of marginalized communities? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, So I assume when you're saying barriers, you mean the, the barriers to marking certain spaces, like the network that I'm writing about is marked as a black space and is difficult for um, people who don't have the cultural competencies to penetrate. Is that sort of what we're talking about? Sure, you can uh, use it as that one, or I'm thinking also, you know, there's digital illiteracy, for example, like people just don't know how to find stuff, for example, on Twitter, or, you know, just, whatever you notice that you know people are, are lacking so that could be your cultural competencies that could be how well people know how to, how to find things um, whatever you see is like a really helpful literacy to develop in terms of engaging digital communities um yeah that's challenging because um part of me thinks like well if, if people don't have if we're talking about the cultural competencies it's sort of like well if you don't have them then the the member of the communities they, they don't want you there, right? So I, I sort of struggle about writing. I call them in the book enclaves, these digital enclaves, and and um, the way in which they they get more visible, and then they become more difficult for that community to use. But there are a lot of people who um, from those like the network that I'm writing about who put things out that are very much. Um, intended to go to a broader audience. So for me, it's always about like the people who created it. Is it intended for the end group or is it intended for the broader audience? Um, for that, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, it's hard, it depends on the platform. Twitter is challenging to navigate. I think in general, people need a better, it comes back to general digital literacy and figuring out sort of reliable sources and what are not reliable sources. Uh, particularly on Twitter, because we know there are a lot of white supremacists and 4chan trolls, and now uh, the Russian intelligence agency uh, that are pretending to be black folks online and saying things that are, they're not, my theory is they're not actually trying to fool other black folks, that they're trying to say things that reaffirm racist caricatures to white people. Um, and so people like, it's, being able to sort of tell the the difference um and so one of the things that can be useful for that is the verified check mark on twitter telling you know helping people find uh commentators people who are public figures and commentators um i i used to maintain a list for my students that you can make a list on twitter of people and then other people can subscribe to it and just see the those people's tweets. And so um, I think it would, for people just starting out on Twitter, um, having a list, an aggregated list of good sources. Um, and yeah, it's challenging because also too, increasingly algorithms are designed to hide these things 
from people who are not part of that community. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not giving you very satisfactory answers because I'm not sure um, the best way to create a, a resource. And um, and Chris, if you uh, if you didn't see Sarah, Chris said in the chat, um, no, those are some good things, and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. That was very kind, Chris. I really wish that I could be like, oh yeah, this this and this, but it's just yeah. I feel like ending on a kind of note of uncertainty about what the future looks like. It might be appropriate for right now. We're at four thirty, um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, for joining us today. This has been um, I, this has been such an amazing Digital Humanities Virtual Hour. Thank you to everyone who took the time to join us and to ask questions. Um, people are applauding you with emojis. Uh, Thanks I see, so much. I see. And I just want to say thank you all for, for logging in and, and being here. I really appreciate you taking an interest um, in my work and hearing me talk, and particularly taking enough of an interest to be willing to have yet another Zoom meeting in your life. Um, I really appreciate that, so thank you.